we come to the section in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus talks about oaths, keeping our promises. And where we're coming at this passage just topically, as we so often do in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, we treat it as sort of this encyclopedia of wisdom and, and rules and laws and regulations and things like that. We treat it as something we go to topically. And where we're doing that, we might fall into the same trap that certain cults and certain fundamentalists in the church have fallen into thinking that this is really about whether or not we should ever make an oath or swear. But it's not about that. What today is about is integrity. That should mark God's kingdom people and therefore be the norm in God's kingdom culture, which is what the Sermon on the Mount is. I remember a story about these four students that were late for their first period class, and there had been a test, and they came in right at the end of it, and they all said to the teacher, sorry, we're late. We got held up by a flat tire. And the teacher said, that's okay. I, I understand those things happen. Actually, you can take the test right now. And so she handed them each a sheet of paper, sent them to the four corners of the room, and then said, this test has just one question. Which tire was flat? Now, let's admit it, all of us have had situations where we're really glad people didn't ask any follow-up questions. Because the truth is, we all lie. We all lie. How do we become such a lying people? Well, Genesis 3 tells us how it happened. The serpent lied, and his lie was a half-truth. Part true, part lie. One of those half-truth things. And Adam and Eve were pulled in, and they fell, and God shows up, and He says, where are you, and what have you done, and what does Adam do? He passes the buck. I didn't do it. The woman that you gave me gave me to eat, and I ate it. Was he factually correct? Yes. Was he telling the truth? No. No. A lot of us lie that way. And then Eve does the same thing. The serpent made me do it. You see, lying became our nature because now, because we fell, we are children of the father of lies, the evil one. And we're going to see that connection even in Jesus' teaching here in this brief passage in Matthew chapter 5. So I encourage you to turn there with me once again. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to simply read from verse 33 to verse 37. You can pull out your notes also in the, in the insert. I hope you want to take down some of the things we have to share today. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. What is Jesus getting at here? We're we just opening it up. We might think, well, sure, this is about oaths and pledges and, and all those different things. And Jesus says, don't... Don't, don't do that. So Jesus is giving a new regulation that replaces the old regulation. But we have the blessing of being in the story. We know what's happening at this part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is contrasting life in the kingdom by God's kingdom people that are described by the, by the Beatitudes, who they are by character, and the impact they have on the culture around them as salt and light, now he's getting into what that looks like when it's lived out. And he's setting real life for those who in their heart hunger and thirst for God against the pseudo-religion of the Pharisees. So he's not contrasting the Old Testament law 
with his new teaching. He's contrasting the way the Pharisees of his day had turned that into a, an attempt to be righteous by obeying the letter of the law. You see, in the Mishnah, which was the Pharisaical code that they had written, very extensive set of rules, hundreds of pages of rules meant to help them more clarify the moral law in the Old Testament, the, the Mosaic law, and it had gotten to the point where it was just very detailed and specific. And, and one of the areas that the Mishnah spent a lot of time on was oaths. And what had happened was that rather than clarifying so that they were people of integrity, the Pharisees had turned oath-giving into the fine art of deceit. That's what they had done. The, 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 the statement that Jesus says in verse 33, you have heard it said long ago, and because he is referring to Moses, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. There's no specific reference of that in the Old Testament, but it does summarize the teaching of Moses in relation to oath giving. And the, the, the important phrase for us to note, to understand what he was saying to the Pharisees, is the words, to the Lord. That's the emphasis in the Old Testament, Moses said, if you make a vow, you keep it because your vow is to the Lord. And what the Pharisees had done is created page after page this very complex system of when an oath was to the Lord and when it wasn't. And the closer your vow was to the Lord, the more bound you were by it. And what that meant was, was that there were ways you could make an oath and actually not keep your promise. Jesus mentions four very common oaths in here. You see, we would miss that if we weren't part of first century Judaism, but everyone there understood that Jesus was referring to four of the most common ways that the Pharisees would make vows that they felt they were not bound to. Those four ways were uh, to uh, heaven, to earth, to Jerusalem, or by, I should say, the words by is very important here, by heaven, by earth, by Jerusalem, or by your head. They believed that those were not references that were close enough to the Lord that you were really bound by. So in other words, you could cross your fingers behind your back and get away. In other words, you could still be righteous. It was legal lying is what it was. That's what they turned God's law into. It's fascinating to think about that. Now, one of the things they said was, you could swear by Jerusalem, but not toward Jerusalem. It's interesting. Because the language toward Jerusalem is about the pilgrimage to the hill of the Lord. So that's too close to God. Jesus, even though in our translation, at least in mine, the translation of by Jerusalem is the same as by heaven and by earth. Actually, he uses a different Greek word. The previous ones are en, which is by or are of, and the word he uses in relation to Jerusalem is eis, which is to or into. So, he's actually saying the more significant of the vow in that case. But what he's saying is don't swear by those, because they had found a way to turn lying into righteous living by virtue of false vows. We see more of this in the polemic section of the Gospel of Matthew, and I want to ask you to turn with me quickly there, Matthew chapter 23. By this point in time, the themes that Jesus introduces in the Sermon on the Mount, contrasting religious righteousness with life in the kingdom, life in Jesus, life not by attaining righteousness through human effort, by, by acknowledging our spiritual poverty, mourning for our sin, and finding mercy through the gospel, that life. The thing, themes he introduced in that contrast now have become part of an ongoing debate between the religious leaders and Jesus. And it reaches a point now where Jesus just unloads on the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Verse 13, 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Let's just explore what Jesus is saying here. He's saying to them, by leading people down this path that you can attain religious righteousness, and then by playing with the rules so actually you're calling sin blessed, you're actually leading people to hell by converting them to your way of thinking. You think you're opening the kingdom of heaven to them, which the Sermon on the Mount is about, right? It's about the kingdom of heaven. You think you're opening the kingdom of heaven to them, and what you're doing is slamming the door on their face, and they're going to perish with you. Wow! I don't think they liked him after this very much. Let's read on. Woe to you, blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. So here we see more of their games that they played. You could swear by the temple, but not by the gold of the temple, because that's more about God. You could swear by the altar, but not by the sacrifice on the altar. If you swore by the sacrifice on the altar, you were bound by it. But if you just swore by the altar, (laughs) you're not bound. That's what Jesus is getting at, is this hypocrisy of oath-giving. Then he goes on, verse 17, you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple? That makes the gold sacred. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. And so in this very strong, clear, direct, angry teaching, Jesus again shows his response to the racket of oath-giving that existed in first century Judaism by making some very important points about it. So, In terms of the art of deception, here is what we learn. Religious legalism creates a culture of dishonesty. That's why Jesus was so mad at them. When you hold people to a standard and say, you have to live this way, otherwise you're not going to get into heaven. When you say you have to follow these rules, inevitably all of us will break the rules. So what do we do? We work our way around it. We make what we fail okay. We all do that. And the Pharisees show us that when we try to achieve heaven, when we try to achieve the kingdom of heaven through religious righteousness, the end result actually is we're creating a bunch of liars. Fundamentalist churches create liars in the pew because we come in and we pretend we're perfect and we're afraid to admit that we're not. And so consequently, no real transformation occurs. Religious righteousness, uh, religious legalism creates a culture of dishonesty. And the second thing is that religious righteousness deceives people into a false sense of security. And that's as true for us today as it was then. Right? So those of us that say, well, I'm a better person than everybody else. God's got to let me into his kingdom. That's deception. That's religious righteousness. You've been lulled into a false sense of security because you can never be good enough. And we've already learned that in the Sermon on the Mount. The whole sermon begins with admitting we will never be good enough for the kingdom. But we're blessed if we acknowledge it because those receive the kingdom of heaven. See? So Jesus is hitting on that very strong. So quickly moving through, what does Jesus teach 
contrasting to the Pharisees, and that's under the point, the heart of integrity. And what we see by both of these teachings are three quick things I want to share with you. Vows and rituals become necessary only because evil came into the world. When, when Jesus says, just say yes, actually the Greek, he says both words twice, yes, yes, and no, no. So it's a little more than just standard conversation. It's an intentional pledge to do the right thing. There's an emphasis in the doubling. But it's not an oath in the way the Pharisees made the oath. And what Jesus points out is that anything else is only necessary and is rooted in the evil one. Now that word, the evil one, is the same word that in the Lord's Prayer is translated by different groups as deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. Your Bible may have one or the other. And so Jesus is just as clearly saying those types of vows are rooted in evil as well. See, and what I want to say just very quickly here is that this is not saying you don't make oaths. God himself made oaths to Abraham and to people to help them understand he was being truthful. Paul, Jesus, made oaths. Oaths are a part of our life. But what Jesus is teaching is that we only need oaths because of the presence of evil in our society. Because of our moral brokenness, we don't speak truth, and we don't trust others to speak truth because we know we don't speak truth. How do we get around that? Oaths. What are some of the oaths you learned when you were a kid to say when you were telling the truth? Cross my heart, hope to die. <laughs> Pinky swear. See, it comes natural to us from the time we're very young because we know in our heart we don't really trust people. So we come up with these ways to know that they're going to tell the truth. Jesus is saying that's the same thing. Oaths came into existence because of moral brokenness. And the second, though, for Christians, any promise we make is a promise to God. That's what he said in the 23rd chapter when he says all these things belong to God, but he specifically says it in the oaths. He says to them of these four areas that were common for oaths, don't swear by heaven for it is God's throne. Don't swear by the earth for it is his footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head because you didn't create it, you didn't control it. God is the creator. You don't turn your hair black or white. In other words, God does that. His point is that the whole earth is God's. To swear by anything is to swear to God. So if you're going to make an oath, keep your promise. That's the point. But the third thing is probably the most important thing that he lands on, and that is when we're in a culture where honesty and truth exist, oaths become unnecessary. Our word becomes enough. You see, this is what happens in the kingdom culture. As we become transformed by the grace of God, become those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, we become those who are peace mark makers. As we become those who have learned to trust and learn that we can be honest before God and be loved in spite of all that he sees in us that's fallen. We learn to be honest and trust one another. In the kingdom of God, vows become unnecessary because we honor, we trust one another. We speak truth in love. And so because of that, in God's kingdom, your yes should be good enough. And your no should be good enough. And that should be the radical difference between God's people in this world and the rest of the world around us. People ought to look at us and say they are people of integrity. Now, how do we get there? How do we become a person of honor? There's so much I could share with this, but I just want to lay four ideas for you to think about in terms of becoming this type of person. Now, first of all, it obviously means you need to be part of the kingdom of heaven. 
This environment of honesty and trust is only possible when people all admit we're all a work in progress and we're willing to be real with each other. If you're here, I want you to know you don't have to put it on. And I'm never going to put it on to you. We're all a work in progress. Grace abounds. And I hope by sharing with you what God's doing in me and sharing with you my growth and my weaknesses, that'll create a trust, an honesty and trust. See, so first of all, you need to be in that community. But I want to suggest four levels of honesty that are part of this transforming work. And the first is learning to be honest with yourself. The best liars I have ever met convince themselves they are not lying. Have you ever experienced that kind of person? You can be so sincere because you've convinced yourself you're telling the truth. The first place where honesty is compromised is in our own spirit because we lie to ourselves about ourselves. Look at these verses. Say them with me quickly first from Jeremiah 17. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? The human heart's deceitful. Who is it deceiving? You. 1 John 1, 8. Say this with me. If we say that we have no fault, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. You see, most of us live right there. We live right there. It shows up in all of our conversations because we perceive ourselves and must never admit that we're the cause of the issue. So we don't allow ourselves to look at ourselves. We never assume that fault or sin, which is the more common translation in 1 John, is from us. The problem is you, not me. And the problem is never just the other person right? We have to learn to admit and to look first at our own brokenness. Otherwise, you will be living not in the truth, and people will know it. It'll show up in your relationships. It'll show up in how God's able to bless your life. People that never own their own contribution to conflict and to situations are people that are lying to themselves. And here's the problem. You are only lying to yourself because everybody else sees it. There's that one of those anti-motivation posters that says, did you ever think that the weakest link in all your relationships is you? We have to learn to become honest with ourselves. The second thing we need to do is to bring truthfulness into our relationships. This is where self-deception can be most destructive. When I come into a setting where I'm being conflicted with a spouse or a sibling or a good friend or in the workplace, and I am unable to be truthful in that moment because my reputation, my being right, my standing is more important to me than honesty. And all of us know people like that. We have all experienced people like that who will never fully admit their wrongdoing. They'll say, for instance, I'm sorry that things went bad between us. What the heck is that apologizing for? You know, right? Right? I, I, I'm sorry that I got so, so caught up and emotional. It means so much to me. Those are self-deceivers that are not bringing truthfulness into the conversation. If you win all of your conflict and manage to convince yourself and get acknowledgement from other people that you're just being misunderstood and really have done nothing wrong, that doesn't prove that you're truthful. It just proves you're the better arguer in the relationship. That's all that proves. And you convince yourself that you're in the right because you win. Winning is not bringing truthfulness into the relationship. So we, we need to bring this willingness to look at ourselves, to, hold a, to use circumstances, to hold a mirror up to our own hearts, and then to come forward honestly and openly into a conversation. James 1.19 is one of the most brilliant verses in all of Scripture, and we overlook it because it's so short 
and so familiar. Each of us should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Man, there's a whole seminar right there in conflict resolution, but we don't have time to go into it today. The third place where we need to talk about personal honor is authenticity in the church. There is no such thing as a mature body in Christ who has not learned to welcome the truth in grace and gladly speak the truth to one another in love. Ephesians 4, say this with me quickly. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of Christ. Being willing to have an honest give and take, not a judgmental one. You know, I've had people come up to me who think they know what's going on in my heart and challenge me about that, and sometimes they're right, but very often they're wrong. I'm not talking about your conclusions about the heart of people. Last time I checked, none of you here are the Holy Spirit. All you can do is react to what you're receiving. So I don't think truth and love as being critical or judgmental. Truth and love I refer to as feedback. It's saying to somebody, can we just kind of talk about what I'm sensing in this relationship or in this conversation. I'm getting, my experience of you is this. Is there any validity to that or my misunderstanding? Learning to come alongside a person, not at them, is speaking the truth in love. There are a lot of people in a lot of churches who think they're speaking the truth in love by speaking their mind. (laughs) I'm just one of those people. I just speak my mind. Speaking your mind is rarely speaking the truth, and it's certainly rarely done in love. That should not be present in the church, right? We need to have everything we do seasoned with grace, but open up and bring authenticity into our church. And then finally, what that leads to is the whole people of God having integrity before the world around them. You know, there is definitely a truth that the church has lost grounds in this country because of our hypocrisy, because our yes is not yes, our no is not no. That needs to show up with your neighbors. What do you need to return that you borrowed from your neighbor two years ago? (laughs) What promise have you made to your kids? That needs to show up at work. Your boss needs to know they're getting a full work week out of you. You know, that has to show up at home in your marriages. We need to be promise keepers. And the world needs to look at us and say, boy, Christians are people who keep their word. So that when they hear the promise of God, they know it's a message that can be counted on to change their lives. It's enough for your yes to be yes and your no to be no if you are a true child of the kingdom. Let's pray.